with a moment of prayer. Father in heaven, Lord, you are indeed worthy. You are worthy of our praise. You are worthy of our exaltation. Lord, you are our creator. You are great. You are above all things. You are above all gods because there is no other God. You are the only God, the one true living God. And Lord, we want to continue to praise you and and, and lift your name high and, Lord, honor you through now our, our hearing and, and listening and, and engaging with your word of truth. The sum of your word is truth. So, Lord, we pray that you would help us to do so in a way that would bring you glory, in a way that would bless our own hearts and, and, and souls, Lord, that we would come to know you better, that we would be all the more diligent in in seeking to apply your truth to our lives as individuals, as families, as a church family. We pray all of this in your son Jesus' most holy, precious, and worthy name. Amen. Last week, <clears throat> excuse me, we entered the territory surrounding the doctrines of election, predestination, and foreknowledge <clears throat> to learn that God has chosen who He will save in advance, even before the foundation of the world, way back in eternity past. And he did this because if he didn't choose to save some, none of us, not one, nobody would be saved. This due to the fact that we are dead in our trespasses and sins. We read in scripture that we are enslaved to our sin. Our hearts are wicked and deceitful. Our minds are are fully depraved, hostile toward God. In fact, there is none righteous, not even one, and no one seeks after God apart from his divine intervention. So he chose some in eternity past so that it would be 100% crystal clear that you and I or anyone would have nothing to do with their salvation, but he would have everything to do with it. And as much as we might accept and embrace these doctrines, I hope and pray, friends, with great joy and with thanksgiving There are others who don't see things quite the same way. In fact, for a number of folks, these are hot-button doctrines that we are talking about because many believe these doctrines of election and predestination to frankly be unfair. They think these doctrines call into question God's goodness and God's grace. They believe that these doctrines strip man of of man's free will. In short, they, they find these doctrines to be disturbing. John MacArthur, when he was teaching on election and predestination to his congregation at Grace Community Church, shared some of these quotes from some different evangelical pastors and writers who have spoken or written against the doctrine of election or the doctrine of predestination. One popular Christian author said this, quote, to suggest that the merciful, long-suffering, gracious, and loving God of the Bible would invent a dreadful doctrine like this, which would have us believe it is an act of grace to select certain people from heaven for heaven and by exclusion others for hell comes perilously close to blasphemy. End quote. 
Another says the flawed theology of predest- excuse me, pre-selection <clears throat> is an attempt to eliminate man's capacity to exercise his free will, which reduces God's sovereign love to an act of a mere dictator. End quote. Another pastor, author, radio teacher says this, this doctrine makes our heavenly father look like the worst of despots. Another pastor has said, five-point Calvinism, which would include the doctrine of election, makes God a monster who eternally tortures innocent children. It removes the hope of consolation from the gospel. It limits the atoning work of Christ. It resists evangelism. It stirs up argumentation and division and promotes a small, angry, judgmental God rather than the large-hearted God of the Bible. I don't know if you've noticed, but I haven't actually mentioned Calvinism this whole time we've been looking at, 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 at these doctrines of salvation. I, I, I don't want you to see a, a certain kind of uh, um, um, grouping that we've kind of come up with to put these doctrines in or these doctrines. I just want you to see that it comes from the Bible. It comes from God's word. Another says this, quote, to say that God sovereignly chooses who will be saved is the most twisted thing I have ever read. It makes God a monster no better than a pagan idol, end quote. Website of theological students in Canada ha- has said this, this doctrine makes God a diabolical monster and reduces man who is created in the image of God to a mere robot. And a popular Christian apologist has said, Quote, this doctrine's misrepresentation of God has caused many to turn away from the God of the Bible as from a monster, end quote. Now, obviously, there's a theme here, right? There's a theme here that equates these doctrines of Scripture with God being a monster? Yes, a monster. And of course, friends, nothing could be further from the truth. I think we all know that, and, and, and my response to all of this is that these folks have never correctly understood these doctrines, or maybe they have not been taught well these doctrines, or simply don't like what these doctrines say, and so they, they come up with their own interpretations of what Scripture teaches. Sometimes, friend, we're going to talk more about free will. I keep saying we're getting there. We're we're going. We're just kind of going a little slowly, right? But sometimes people want their free will so badly that they are willing to just lay aside, push aside, disregard what Scripture says. And I'm not saying the Scripture doesn't teach about free will. It does. And again, we'll we'll be getting there in, in, in increments here. But they want their freedom to choose God so much that they ignore his word. Or or they just flat out play kind of, you know, loosey-goosey with these texts or doctrines. Or they ignore them. And frankly, in so doing, that's a travesty. They they miss out on, on blessings for themselves. And they miss out on bringing glory to God. And the sad thing is, is when properly understood, these doctrines, election, predestination, foreknowledge, they are are glorious doctrines that every believer, believer, should be rejoicing in. And therein lies the key. Therein lies the key because, see, one of the, the big problems that people have with these doctors is when they, doctrines is when they try to apply these doctrines to unbelievers, which the scriptures never do. That's when, when things get, get kind of wacky, weird, and don't make a lot of sense. These doctrines, election, predestination, they are for the saved. They are for the regenerate. Therefore, the born again. They are there to encourage us, friends, and to to strengthen our faith by showing us how it is that wicked, dead sinners like us, unable to come to God, can come to God, can be saved. I mean, you're never going to say to an unbeliever, you know what? 
You can only go to heaven if you are a part of God's elect and your name's written in the book of life. You're just not going to say that. You're only going to heaven, friend, if you've been chosen and predestined by him. To which the person then thinks, well, I don't know. I don't know, God, so I guess I'm not part of the elect. Guess I haven't been predestined or chosen by him. Guess my name's not written in the book of life. Pepesha. No, these doctrines are for you who have already put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. They are for the saved. Imagine, imagine you are, <clears throat> you're walking along and you see the narrow gate that leads to heaven, right? And, and as you approach the gate, you look up and there's a sign over the gate that reads, whoever will believe and enter will be saved. We could expand on that, right? Whoever would believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and enter will be saved. And you go, yeah, I believe. I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior. He died for my sins on the cross three days later, resurrected. I'm going through the gate. And you go through the gate. And now you're on the other side. And yet many people will come to that gate and they'll see that too, but they won't enter that gate. They'll go down a different path. But those of you who have entered through that gate, you get to the other side of that sign and you look back now from heaven's side and you see that the sign says chosen by God before the foundation of the world. That's how it's for believers. That doctrine's not for unbelievers it's for you and i to be encouraged to know how it is we can be saved that we have been saved friends only god knows who he has chosen to save therefore we cannot apply the doctrines of election and predestination to unbelievers god has a message to unbelievers guess what that message is repent repent and believe repent and believe in the lord jesus christ and you will be saved that's the truth okay go ahead and turn your bible second thessalonians second thessalonians chapter two our sovereignty of god study got underway when we we got to this passage of second thessalonians 2 verses 13 to 15 so we are going to always kind of start off with this passage and remind us that that's why we're here let's go ahead and stand for the reading of god's word by the end of this you should have this passage memorized right I should, <laughs> certainly. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 13 to 15. The Lord, through the Apostle Paul, writing to the Thessalonians, says this. But we should always give thanks to God for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and faith in the truth. It was for this he called you through our gospel, that you may gain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brethren, stand firm and hold to the traditions which you were taught, whether by word of mouth or by letter from us. And this is the word of God. You may be seated. I maybe should have phrased it as the, the words of Paul by way of the Holy Spirit, right, to the Thessalonians. Now, what I, what I want to do today, I know we've been just kind of camped out on these doctrines. <clears throat> I think this is our... Our, our second week, and, and I think we're going we're gonna to tackle a few more common questions that come up even, even next week in this realm of election, predestination, God choosing. And, and so I want to start answering some of these questions that I am hopefully anticipating you're coming up with and you're thinking about, and uh, by doing so, continue to reveal to you these tremendous doctrines of, of God's choice through election and predestination i think maybe the number one question or or problem that people come up with when learning about this doctrine aside from trying to apply them to unbelievers which again the scripture doesn't do it's this idea in their minds that these doctrines just don't seem fair 
They just don't seem fair. It, it just doesn't seem fair that God would choose some and not others. That God would choose to save some and not others. So we ask the question, why does God choose to save some and not others? Let's go back to the part where we're all sinners with absolutely no ability to rectify our sinful situations, no ability to save ourselves. And what, what has God deemed the consequence to be for our sin? And this takes us to our first point. God could let all people die in their sin if he chose to do so, right? He could let all people die in their sin. The scriptures teach that every person of the human race, save for Jesus, has been sentenced to death and even hell for their sins against a holy, righteous God. Physical death as well as spiritual death, which means spiritual separation from God all eternity in hell, followed by the lake of fire. And not just separation. Lest we be accused of sugarcoating anything, we're talking about punishment. We're talking about judgment and punishment. Matthew 10 and verse 28. Jesus says, Do not fear those who kill the body but are unable to kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Soul and body in hell. Matthew 25 and Mark 9 both tell us that this place is a place of eternal punishment, an eternal fire where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. In Revelation 20 and verse 15, we read, And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. So going back to that fairness question, if, if you might be one thinking, yeah, that doesn't seem fair. It, it just doesn't. And I know we mentioned this, but we're going to touch on it again. Friends, the truth is, what would be fair for all of us is to be cast right now into hell and the lake of fire. That's what would be fair. And the fact that God lets anyone live, even in their sin, is an act of his grace and his mercy. Because, frankly, what we all deserve is punishment in hell immediately. It should have already happened. This is what's fair. What's fair is that God's justice demands punishment that we be punished it would be fully in his right to punish sinners long before they physically died so to say that election is not fair or just of god believe you me we don't want what's fair and we don't want what's just Every day an unredeemed sinner is given life and breath is God withholding what is fair and just. And we call this the mercy of God. The mercy of God. God keeping back from us that which we really deserve. Well, I'll give you an illustration like this. Imagine, uh, imagine if you committed a bank robbery. It's obvious you're guilty because you didn't wear a mask. You know, many eyewitnesses, they've all ID'd you. They've all shared the same story about how you did it. The robbery's caught on multiple video cameras. You're guilty. But the courts are so backed up, it may take years before you get a trial date. So while you're waiting to go to trial, the judge just says, you know what? You're free to go. Dad, just go. Go. You get to go home and live a normal life and, until the trial. Basically, you're on borrowed time. You know you deserve to be punished, and it would be totally just for you to be tossed into prison that very instant. In other words, every day that you have outside of jail, that's an act of mercy. It's an act of mercy by the judge. That's the way it is for anyone apart from Jesus Christ. 
Any day that you aren't punished for your sins is an act of mercy by a merciful God. So, if God chose to let all people suffer the consequences of their sins, it would be totally fair and just of him to do so because none of us deserves to be saved. This brings us to our second point. God chooses some and not others. He chooses some and not others. But instead of allowing all of us to go to hell because of our sin, he extends mercy, he extends grace to some by choosing them for salvation. And you, you, you hear that and you, and you want to cry out again, but again, that doesn't seem fair. It just doesn't. Ah. And remember what we learned about fairness, right? Yes, okay, I get that, but why not all? I mean, if he's going to do it for some, just why not all? Why not everyone? Why would he, why would he choose some to be saved and not others, especially if it's not based on their works and it's not based on their merits or them choosing him? I mean, come on, if we're all sinners and we're all on an equal playing field, all deserving of hell, then why does one person get chosen over another? This is actually a very easy question to answer. But it's sometimes a very difficult question or answer, excuse me, to accept. Very easy question to answer, sometimes very difficult answer to accept. Let's start by turning to Deuteronomy 10. Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 10. Why did God choose Abraham to be the father of many nations? Why did God then choose Jacob to be the father of the Jewish nation? Why did God choose the nation of Israel above all others to be his people, the recipients of his special blessing. Deuteronomy 10. Look at verse 14. 10 and verse 14. Behold. It's Moses. Moses talking to the people. Behold to the Lord your God belong heaven and the highest heavens. The earth and all that is in it. Yet on your fathers did the Lord set his affection to love them. And he chose their descendants after them, even you above all peoples as it is this day. Right there on the plains of Moab, getting ready to go in the promised land. Moses is talking to all the people, and this is what he tells them. So think about it. Could God have chosen some other people group of the day, some other nation living at that time to bless and be his special people of course of course he could have so so why did he choose the nation of israel why not some other nation or people group they were all everybody was descended from noah everybody before him was descended from adam right they were all sinners we don't know we don't know We don't. We're not told other than it was God's prerogative to do so, being the creator of the earth and all people in it. And that's it. That's it. Let's ask another question. Did God choose Israel? Because God looked down through the corridor of time and he saw this people Israel. That, man, they're going to be an awesome people. They're going to be an obedient people to the nth degree. They're just going to love God perfectly and worship Him perfectly and just do everything that God wants them to do. And they're going to love Him with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength. And they're going to choose, they're going to choose God over all other false gods. Did God do that? Did he, did he choose Israel because Israel is just going to be so doggone wonderful? 
No. I mean, they had their good and positive moments, right? I don't want to belittle any of that. But they also had plenty of sinful moments as well. And as far as we can tell, there's no reason that he should have chosen them over any other people group other than he did. He did. Remember, Scripture teaches us that there are those secret things of God that we are not privy to, Deuteronomy 29, 29. God doesn't tell us everything, friends. We think he should. We do, but he doesn't. He doesn't have to tell us anything, frankly. So anything he does tell us, the Bible, is a blessing, right? But there's plenty of things not in the Bible that God knows that he doesn't tell us. I'm sure of it. And indeed, he doesn't have to, and it's totally just and right for him to do things this way. Because he's God. I I think uh, right about now, it might be good to remind ourselves of uh, Isaiah 55, 8 and 9, which says, this is God speaking through the prophet Isaiah, for my thoughts, capital M, right? My thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways My ways, declares the Lord, for as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than yours, and my thoughts than your thoughts. (laughs) Right? I mean, we have to remember that, 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 that we see things from a very limited, human, tainted by sin perspective. Right? We do. Let's see what the New Testament has to say. Oh, here we go. Turn to Romans 9. Romans 9. Got to uh, talk about some of the verses in this glorious chapter. Romans 9. Here Paul, Apostle Paul wants to make a point about the sovereignty of God in choosing whom he wants to receive salvation. It's born out of a, quote, great sorrow and unceasing grief for Paul's kinsmen, in quotes there, who are Israelites, who have many promises and blessings from God, and yet as individuals, their eternal salvation can only come as far as they are chosen by God. And to illustrate Paul shows how God chose one family line over another to receive blessings of promise of being his special people. In fact, regarding Abraham, not all of Abraham's descendants would receive these promises, but only Isaac, born through his wife Sarah. This continued when Isaac married um, Rebecca, like, wait a minute, I'm getting my names twisted. No, no, Isaac born through his wife, uh, that's where I messed up, through his wife, Abraham's wife, right? Isaac born through Abraham's wife, Sarah, continued when Isaac married Rebecca, and this is where we're going to pick things up. Look at verse 10. Verse 10. Not only this, but there was Rebecca also. When she had conceived twins by one man, our father Isaac, really quick, who were the twins? Esau and Jacob, right? Jacob and Esau. Verse 11, for though the twins were not yet born and had not done anything good or bad, it's kind of important, so that God's purpose according to his choice would stand, not because of works, but because of him who calls, that would be the him is God, it was said to her, the older will serve the younger. Just as it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I, say it, hated. These are a tough few verses for people to swallow. Jacob I loved, oh that's good. Esau I hated? God? Really? So we have these twins in Rebecca's womb, Esau and Jacob, and we've learned from other places in Scripture that both boys are sinners. Sin has been imputed to them, going back to 
Adam and his sin, right? Just like we previously learned. They were conceived in sin. They were brought forth in sin. They have a sin nature, even though the text tells us they haven't yet done anything good or bad while still in the womb. That's that original sin that we are all born with. And yet Paul tells us that God will love one, Jacob, and hate the other, Esau. And that the older, Esau, will actually serve the younger. Which was a no-no, basically. The younger's not going to serve the older. The older's the you know, big man on campus. He's the one in charge. He gets the birthright. He gets the blessings. This is a quote from Genesis 25 and verse 23. When the Lord spoke to a pregnant Rebecca telling her that, quote, two nations are in your womb and the older shall serve the younger. Two nations being Israel, represented by Jacob, Edom, represented by Esau. It normally would have been the other way around. The older would be the greater of the two, and as I said, receive that birthright and blessing, and the younger would be subservient to his older brother. But God had decided to reverse things. Wait, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Can God do that? Yes, he can. Why? Because he's God, right? He reverses things, which is his prerogative to do so because it's all about his choice in fulfilling his purposes. Then we get again to that, that, that classic line. Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. That's a quote from Malachi chapter 1, verses 2 and 3. When the Lord is speaking through the prophet Malachi to the nation of Israel descended from Jacob. And the Lord tells Israel, quote, I have loved you, says the Lord. But you say, well, how have you loved us? Back to God. Was not Esau's, Esau Jacob's brother, declares the Lord? Yet I have loved Jacob, meaning Israel. But I have hated Esau, meaning Edom, and I have made his mountains a desolation and appointed his inheritance for the jackals of the wilderness. Well, that doesn't sound very nice. Poor Esau, poor Edom, you know. And it says that God did it this way so that his choice would stand. In other words, he wanted it clear that his decision was not based on any, any good works that Jacob might have done to seemingly have warranted God's favor. I mean, think about that, right? Because truth be told, a pretty strong case could be made for the opposite with Jacob, right? He was a treacherous deceiver. Come on. Or didn't want it to be that it was bad works that Esau might have done to deny his favor. They're both still in the womb when God makes this decision. They hadn't been able to make good or bad choices yet. So if God chooses to love one and not the other, or to bless one and not the other, or to choose one and not the other, guess what? It's his right to do so. I, I know that's maybe not very satisfying to some of us. But see, God sees some big picture things that we don't see, that we're just frankly not privy to. Again, those secret things of God. And it says that God did it this way so that his choice would stand. That takes us to our third point. God is not unjust in his choices. So if we start getting on that fairness kick again, we have to be reminded God is not unjust in his choices. We'll continue on in our text. Verse 14, Paul says this, Romans 9, 14, What shall we say then? There is no injustice with God, is there? It's a rhetorical question. Of course not. May it never be, he says. In other words, there is never any injustice with God because if there was, guess what? <laughs> he wouldn't be God. He would cease to be God. He is by his very nature altogether perfect and holy and righteous and truthful and completely just in all his ways. So when he chooses Jacob and not Esau or Israel and not Edom or Rodrigo and not Carla or Ming and not Alexander. It's not based on works or one doing good or one doing bad. It is simply his choice, his again prerogative to do so. And 
it is a completely just and righteous decision because he is God. You know, we might say, well, we don't understand. We don't understand God's decision to choose one and not another. And friends, we don't have to understand it. Again, maybe it's because it's part of the secret things of God. But here's the thing. We must accept it. And we must accept it in a way that doesn't deny God any of his glory. We can't deny him any glory. Because ultimately, that's what these, again, are all about. Even God choosing one and not another, it's ultimately for his glory. Let's continue on. Look at verse 15. Paul gives another example of God's sovereignty in choosing. Going back to when Moses, remember this time Moses asked to see God's glory, right? And God hides him in the cleft of the rock and then passes by him. Verse 15 says, for he says to Moses, God talking to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. Let me just put in parentheses here, friends. It's it's kind of a nice way of saying, I can do whatever I want because I'm God. Verse 16, so then it does not depend on the man who wills or the man who runs, but on God who has mercy. There is nothing that man, you or I, can will in our hearts or minds to try to do anything by our own efforts or merit in order to bring about God's compassion or mercy on us. Because these things don't depend on us at all. They they just depend on God. Paul continues with another illustration. In verse 17, having to do with Pharaoh, he says, For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose, I raised you up to demonstrate my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed throughout the whole earth. So then he has mercy on whom he desires, and he, ooh, underline this one, hardens whom he desires. That's another difficult one for some of us to swallow, that God would harden someone's heart. So, yes, along with the mercy and compassion, God also has the right to harden a heart of anyone whom he desires. Now, you remember how God did that to Pharaoh's heart. Pharaoh was already a sinner against God, not letting the people go. But then God made sure that Pharaoh did exactly what he wanted him to do by hardening his heart so as not to let God's people go. And you go, huh. Now that that kind of makes Pharaoh sound like he was nothing more than a puppet of God. You know, like Pharaoh's some kind of marionette on strings and God's just making him do whatever he wants to do. Well, let me ask you this. Do you think Pharaoh felt like he was a puppet? Do you think Pharaoh felt like he was a marionette? Like he's, well, why did I say that? Well, I didn't want to say that. I didn't mean to say that. Oh, these things just keep coming out of my mouth. No, don't make me do that, God. I want to let the people go. I want to let them go. <laughs> do you think he felt manipulated by God? Like he was being forced to do things against his will in regard to Moses and the people? Of course not. Of course not. And scripture never says as much. So this, friends, now, it's getting really fun. Now we have this this kind of tension that's held between God's sovereignty on the one hand and man's free will on the other. And this is when we start... Uh, people have a problem with this. It gets a little more of a mind bender, hard to understand. Now, some people have given this this deal a, a, a name, this doctrine a name. They call it the doctrine of concurrence. Concurrence, meaning two things that happen at the same time. Biblically, it refers to the relationship between God's sovereignty and providence with the free will actions of people. 
In other words, God hardening Pharaoh's heart so he wouldn't let the people go, while at the same time, Pharaoh is making a free will decision to not let the people go. And guess what? Both are happening. Both. We call this a paradox. A paradox. Independent truths that seem contradictory or irreconcilable with each other and yet are held together by faith. By faith. Another paradox in the Bible, one of a, a classic paradox is this, right? Jesus is 100% God. Jesus is 100% man. How can he be both? I don't know, but he is. And we have to hold truths like this in what we call kind of a tension with each other. Some Christians have a, a, a big problem with God sovereignly controlling and providentially causing things to happen in, in people's lives. Thinking, well, again, is that all we are? We're just puppets to God? We're just doo doo Mary Nancy's He's just making us do whatever he wants to do, say whatever he wants us to say. No, they think. No, no, it can't be that way. I have to have my free will, and it has to be completely independent of God. Christian author Jerry Bridges, love Jerry Bridges. Jerry Bridges, in his book, Trusting God, he explains this tension as well as I've ever heard it explained. He writes this, quote, God does sovereignly intervene in the hearts of people so that they make decisions and carry out actions that accomplish his purpose for our lives. Yet, God does this in such a way that these people make their decisions and carry out their plans by their own free will and voluntary choices. End quote. I think that's an excellent way of understanding these truths and the tension that has to be held with them we're gonna we'll continue to go further with that when we get to our our uh, our response to god calling us for salvation because we would all say that there was a time when because of your exercising your own free will you believed right you repented i trusted in jesus Christ. And that's true. It's absolutely true. We'll, we'll talk more about that in another message. So, I know we took a little detour. Let's get back to Romans 9, because there's just still a couple more goodies that I want you to see. So, we just uh, we're in verse 18, Romans 9, where he said, He has mercy on whom he desires, and he hardens whom he desires. Then verse 19, we see Paul still kind of arguing with his imaginary opponent, right? And he says, you will say to me then, why does he still find fault? For who resists his will? And this takes us to our fourth point. God, as creator, controls his creation. God as creator controls his creation. Paul's opponent is saying, if we can't resist God's will, his choosing some and not others, then why is anything our fault? Why is anything our fault? If our salvation is based on God electing and predestining some to believe, then how can anyone be held responsible for not having been chosen? And on the outset, that might seem like a kind of reasonable thing to ask, right? Uh, how can we be at fault for not being saved and, and consequently be punished and sent to hell if we didn't have a choice, if we weren't chosen? It, it sure seems unfair that one person again gets elected for salvation and not another. Look at verse 20. Paul says, on the contrary. Oh, here comes the hammer. Who are you, O oh man, who answers back to God? Even to ask the question, why does he still find fault? Shame on us. Be quiet. Close your mouth. Who do you think you are? 
I mean, do you, do you dare think God to be unjust in his choices? Do you dare accuse him of being unfair? Do you dare accuse him of unjustly punishing sinners? Do you dare accuse him of condemnation and even evil against transgressors? You better be quiet. Just zip it. Throw away the key, right? You better be quiet because you're going to get yourself into bigger trouble. Look at the illustration Paul then gives in verse 20. The thing molded will not say to the molder, why did you make me like this? Will it? Or does the potter not have a right over the clay to make from the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for common use? And you can imagine, think of a potter, potter's wheel, right? And they got their clay and their wheels going and you know they're going to town and and something just doesn't look well yeah you know what not happy with that one crunch redo get going try it again this that the other whatever does that lump of clay at any point in time ever have the the right to go whoa time out dude stop why are you making me like this what are you doing we you know we go out to Went out to the beach last uh, Monday, the day off, and built sandcastles. It was fun. And uh, I was thinking about it like that, you know, because what do you like to do after you build a sandcastle? Then somebody loves to come along and smash it, right? So you build the sandcastle, and then, you know, your youngest son, who will remain nameless, you know, wants to come and just kunk. And you're like, dude, I built that. You don't have any right over that castle. I'm the one that made that castle. You don't have any right, and the castle doesn't have any right to say, why'd you make me? Why'd you put a moat around me? Why'd you build me like this, right? It's ridiculous. Ridiculous. Who is it that would dare to question God's purposes and plans for any of us? Who are we as God's creation to talk back to him and tell him how he should have made us? I can't help but think of Job. I should have put in one of the passages in there, right? Job starts getting a little mouthy with God, right? And then God finally goes, whoa, time out, Job. Let's talk. And Job, at the, at the end of it, where were you? Where were you? Where were you? And Job's like, I repent. Ah, I repent. Or that we don't like the way he made us, or we wish he had made us like somebody else. God's the potter. We're the clay. And the clay is so far beneath the potter. I mean, the clay is nothing but clay, dirt, water, right? No rights whatsoever. It doesn't hold some special position or office that it should be granted an audience with the potter to be heard because clay's nothing the potter is all the rights the potter is the one who gets to make any decision as to whether that lump of clay is going to be made into a beautiful cup that will be used by a king or whether it's going to be a, a pot for a peasant's stew clay doesn't get to decide only the potter does clay has no say in the matter paul gives a further illustration in verse 22 what if God, although willing to demonstrate his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction. <coughs> Uh-oh, we're getting into some other very interesting territory here. First, let's ask this about God's wrath. Does God have a right to demonstrate his wrath? Absolutely. Uh, to make his power known through his wrath, if that's what he chooses to do? Absolutely. Won't his wrath even bring him glory because it shows that his justice prevails? Absolutely. God is glorified when the power of his wrath, friends, is put on display. And won't we be vilified when the day comes when all who have opposed God receive their, their just condemnation and punishment? Again, we say, amen. Amen. We who have suffered under the hands of the oppressors will one day give glory to God when he deals out his retribution and wrath. Now, notice something else about verse 22, and this is where, where some of you I know are, are already thinking. Verse 22, it's, it's something very important here that often gets misinterpreted, and it gets misinterpreted quite often. He's talking about unbelievers here, those who are not his elect. And people get this really mixed up. And they, 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 they say that if God elects some for salvation, then this verse seems to tell us that he also elects some for damnation. 
destruction. Meaning God is at the same time predestining some for heaven, and then he's also then predestining some to go to hell. It, it's, we typically call this double predestination. And let me just say very clearly, it is not what the Bible is teaching here or anywhere else. It's not what Paul is teaching. It's not what God is teaching. Notice the positioning of the word endured and then prepared. It doesn't say that God prepared vessels of wrath, but rather that he, what? Endured vessels of wrath. He puts up with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction. Prepared there, this is also important, it is a, it's a passive verb in the Greek, which tells us something extremely important. It is not God who did this preparing. It is not God who did this preparing. God did not prepare them for destruction. You say, well, who did? Ah, the vessels. The vessels did. The people did. They do by the fact of their sin. Their sins against God is what sentenced them to wrath, destruction, and hell. Who is it that are sinners? All of us. In other words, we have all been on this path towards wrath and destruction by our own doing, and we would all end up in hell as the consequence for our sins because, again, we're enslaved to sin, we're unreceptive to spiritual truth, we cannot... We cannot um, Discriminate between right and wrong. We oppose God's purposes and values. We delight in evil, even pursue it, and we are dead. Unable to save ourselves. And while God could simply wipe us off all, all off of the face of the earth, instead the text says that he endures us as sinners, even with much patience. I think of my own life and I go, gosh, I didn't get saved until, gosh, what, close to late 20s. I go, man, Lord, oh, I'm so sorry. I mean, he endured with much patience me for the, the, that time. God's plan continues. Look at verse 23. And he did so to make known the riches of his glory upon vessels of mercy, which he prepared this is an active verb, not a passive verb. It's God now doing the preparing. The preparing of who? Those vessels of mercy. When did he do it? Beforehand for glory. Even us, whom he also called, not from among Jews only, but also from among Gentiles. We're going to wrap things up here shortly, gang. Now, we see his predestining and electing of some of these vessels of wrath to become vessels of mercy for his glory. When did he do that? Beforehand, before the foundation of the world from all eternity. In other words, the scripture clearly teaches that we would all be vessels of wrath prepared for destruction by our own doing not God preparing us for destruction by our own sin, but our merciful God predestined some before the foundation of the world to be vessels of his mercy for his glory. There is no double predestination. God predestined some for mercy, and the rest we prepare ourselves for destruction by our sinfulness. Paul then wraps it up by pointing out this sovereign choice of God in electing some to salvation and the fact that it didn't just include the Jews, but the Gentiles as well. Hallelujah, what a Savior, right? So what do we do with all this? Whew, I know it's a lot to take in. I know it's a lot to think about. 
please, as we go through these, continue to think about things. Ponder them through the week. Be like the Bereans. Continue to search the scriptures to see if these things are so. Ask God to help you in understanding some of these difficult truths. And again, remember, friends, the doctrines of election and predestination, they are for you and I as believers because they are there to encourage us, to show us how it is that we could be saved even though we were dead in our trespasses and sins. That is how he does it. That is how we can come to God. That is how we can repent and believe and trust. That is how we can be saved. And, 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 and friends, this week, just oh, I hope you'd meditate on those truths and just give God glory. Praise to Him. Glory to Him. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thanksgiving to Him. Thank you for my salvation. Thank you. What a, what a miracle. Acknowledge His tremendous mercy and grace towards you and for the gift of salvation, the gift of Jesus Christ. Give Him glory for electing you. Choosing you, predestining you. And if you're not sure, if you're sitting there and you're like, oh, I, well, I'm, I'm just not sure if I'm part of the elect. I don't know if my name's written in the, the book of life. Then here's the deal, friends. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ right here, right now, and be saved. And guess what? Then you know you're the elect. Then you know your name is written in the book. That's God's call for you. Repent and believe in Jesus Trust that he is the savior of the world. That he went to the cross on your behalf for your sin. That he became sin for us when his arms were stretched out and the nails put into him. And that, that he, 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 he didn't just stay dead on the cross but was taken down, put into the tomb and three days later resurrects from the dead so that you and I know that we too will have that tremendous promise, that hope of resurrection ourselves based on what he has done. Repent and believe and trust him today, friends. And, if, and, 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 and since we don't know who the elect are, we don't know who they are, we need to just be diligent to evangelize the lost. That's sometimes what people who believe in these doctrines get accused of. Well, you probably don't evangelize. If you believe in predestination and election, I'm sure you don't evangelize. Of course we evangelize because we don't know who's predestined and elected. So get out there and share Christ with people. Share the gospel with people. Don't be afraid. Know that it's this glorious message that will offer them salvation and eternal life. That they would indeed then know that they are the elect. And they'll come to the other side of that gate and see that sign. Elected, predestined before the foundation of the world. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord. We thank you for just all oh, these tremendous truths. And I know, Lord, it's a lot to take in. It's a lot to swallow. And I pray that you'd help each one of us to just come to, to good resolutions with these texts and with these doctrines, Lord, that we would give you much glory because of it, that it would encourage us, that, Lord, if there's anyone here this morning that needs to repent, that they would repent, and that we, Lord, would be on fire for the gospel. We pray this all in your son Jesus' name. Amen.